Welcome back. It is time for the Tuesday edition of Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast brought to you on video by our great friends at BetUS. Make sure you check out BetUS. And if you use the code YouTube50, guess what? 150% deposit bonus because Mo and I know people. That's right. YouTube 150, 150% deposit bonus up to $2,000 on your first deposit. Go check it out. We'll talk about it a little later in the show, but thank you to BetUS. All right, Mo. Uh, man, listen, uh, we haven't seen each other since the big win on Sunday. And as I called it, the the pillow fight in Las Vegas. <clears throat> these two, two of these teams, uh, you know, it doesn't matter, though. You play who's in front of you. And, um, you know, this is a big win for the Raiders, Mo, to me. I mean, look, I'm not going. I said it in a video I did for the channel here uh, on Monday. I'm not going saying this team's going to be a championship team. But where they were, the the the, the locker room turmoil – the loss to Carolina, the way this one ended, because, again, they didn't play four quarters. They played really two good quarters, bookended by some poor offensive play and uh, play calling, in my view. But um, they got the win. And they not only got the win, but they got performances from young players. We saw Charles Snowden there at the end of the game uh, shut down the Browns and and basically end it for, for the Raiders on defense. That was a big situation. Everybody had the kind of knot in their throat thinking, oh, no, here we go again. But they come through. Want to get your reaction to this win. Listen, there's a lot to work on, but they needed to get over this first hump, which was A, get back on the winning track, and B, get together as a team and feel like you're united. No such thing as an ugly win. All Ws look the same in the, in the standings, right? So – the Raiders win the football game, albeit against the bad Browns team. But let's not forget that the Raiders came off of an embarrassing loss to the Carolina Panthers. So they weren't playing well either. And on top of that, no Devontae Adams on the offensive side of the ball, no Max Crosby on the defensive side of the ball. So you're down your two, arguably your two best players. So they responded. So we talked about last week about the whole business decision comment from Antonio Pierce. We talked about the team meeting that they had. Whereas Mayor White said they were personal things aired out. And the player said it was a, a much needed meeting that it needed to happen and it was productive. Mm-hmm. And so far it looked like it was because you're thinking without Max Crosby and Devontae Adams, the Raiders are, you know, potentially could go 0 and 2 at home to start the season, which would be a disaster. But they, you know, they pull it together. As you said, it wasn't a complete game where they played well all four quarters, but they did enough to get a W, and that's what matters. The two biggest things that stick out to me, the run game came back. Well, find, well, it appeared for the first time this year, really. And young players stepping up. I talked about Isaiah Polamau on Twitter, and I mentioned also mentioned Charles Snowden, another guy who was undrafted when he came out of uh, college. So those two guys stepping into big roles. Snowden finishing the game with some big plays and that sack on Deshaun Watson, I think is huge for this team's uh, morale boost. Yeah, and to me, that's that's the point I was making was, look, I'm not saying, God bless him, I'm not saying Charles Snowden's going to be some superstar in the NFL, but when you have players go down, this is what we talk about with depth. We're not talking about having all pro uh, backups at every position. We're talking about guys like this who step up when they need to step up in a bind when the team is without its best players. And that's what happened here. And we saw on the offense, to your point, you know, the, the running game comes back. We saw on Monday at Antonio Pierce's press conference saying, you know, he said what we all knew, which was that Alexander Madison deserved more touches. And that was the one thing I talked about with Murph and the post game show Mo was, I didn't understand it because uh, he just did. He only had five carries in that game, but he was every time he touched the ball, he seemed to have impact. And of course, Zamir White, don't know what's up with him, but he's going to have to, uh, you know, I think give up some of those those carries because because Alexander Madison has earned them. And when they were running the ball and they were doing it effectively, you saw how it took some of the pressure off Gardner Minshew. And it also, you saw that offensive line with two rookies, DJ Glaze, who struggled at the beginning but came on. And then, of course, Jackson Powers Johnson. Those guys look really good at times. Well, yes, they made mistakes. They're rookies. But overall, I was very, very excited to see some sequences where they really not only created lanes for running, but also in pass protection. Yeah, so that would be the third thing. The third big thing from that game is the offensive line. Thanks for mentioning that. Starters JPJ, Jackson Powers Johnson, and DJ Glaze, who was stepping in for Thea Mumford, who's dealing with knee and ankle injuries, 
both played pretty well, and they gave that offensive line a boost. They gave that run game a boost. Gardner Minshew, I, would, I wouldn't say was under duress throughout the whole game. I'd say <laughs> Gardner Minshew's issue was he was inaccurate. But as far as the offensive line is concerned, I think the Raiders have their starting five, and I said this on the Bleacher Report live on Sunday after the game. From left to right, Colton Miller, Jackson Powers Johnson, Andre James, Dylan Parham, Thayer Mumford slash DJ Glaze, depending on what happens when Thayer Mumford gets healthy. But I think that that's their best five combination, uh, assuming that Thayer Mumford is healthy, though I wouldn't mind if DJ Glaze is a starter. You roll with that five, you let those you let that unit build some chemistry, and you would hope as the season goes on, the offensive line gets better and better. Yeah, unless Theo Mumford's gone for several weeks, I would understand them putting him back there. But I liked what I saw to DJ Glaze. Again, started off a little rocky, had a penalty at the beginning of the, of the game in the first quarter there, but put it together. Uh, and I think that you're right. I think you just need to roll with that. I mean, of course, if you're getting your quarterback killed or something, you got you got to make changes. But I think they need to get some 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 cohesive chemistry going there with that offensive line. And then for the quarterback, for Gardner Minshew being able to do it, I did notice, and, and we'll get into this a little bit too in segment two, and then of course segment three, we'll get to your calls on the Raider Nation mailbag. But I, I, what I did notice too was we saw some changes from Luke Getze. Uh, I think he lacked consistency again, so he did introduce new things. He opened the playbook up, Mo. We saw Gardner Minshew under center more, which was good in some ways, I think, you know, because they were trying to do this. But then we saw some of the same mistakes we saw with some of the running plays, and who knows, you know, so, some of that I have to watch the film to see what happened. But to me, it was like Luke Getze uh, took a big step back against Carolina, then uh, against against uh, um, this team against. Um, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on me? Hello, Browns. against the Browns. Oh my gosh, Mo, I got to get some sleep. Against the Browns, we saw him kind of do what he did with Baltimore, which is he changed it up. But then we saw him go away from that again. And that's that's still what concerns me with this because it goes back to the C word. It goes back to consistency. Now, I get it. You open up the playbook. You do things a little bit different. But then it seems like he gets tight and conservative and he pulls back. And I don't know if that's him, if that's coming from Pierce. I, I don't know. I'm assuming it's from the offensive coordinator. But did you see some of that too or was it me? I think what the Raiders tried to do was they, they had an early lead, right? Mm -hmm. So they get it. Browns start off fast, by the way. Then the yeah. Raiders come back. They tie it up. They, they get a lead. I think late in the game, the play call was conservative one because I think there was a concern about Gardner Minshew's accuracy. And go back to that point. Gardner Minshew was 14 to 24. He didn't have his top playmaker in Devontae Adams. Brock Bowers didn't have a lot of targets. He had three targets. So you're down your top playmaker your your passing attack isn't really humming the ground game is and then i think he got a bit predictable toward the end mm -hmm. and there were con some conservative moments there and they just it felt like the Raiders were just trying to hold on to the lead instead of building on it and that that's what let the browns back in the game demir white has that critical fumble browns scoop and score a touchdown they missed the pat which to me changed it definitely changed the game because on that last drive, instead of kicking a game-tying field goal, the Browns have to score a touchdown because they missed that PAT. So thankfully for the Raiders, the Browns <laughs> were just as were just as mistake-prone as the Raiders were previously, and the Raiders were able to pull out that game. But I agree with you. The, the play calling, a bit inconsistent, but it is good to see the run game get going. You would hope that it gets better, the offense as a, as a whole, once Devontae Adams is back in action, whenever he is back in action. Right. And again, I'm taking all the positives away from this. I think it was a big win for this team because it's building blocks, right? It is important with all that they had gone through during the week. It was important for them to go through challenges again and the adversity. Like you said, you just called it out perfectly at the end of the game and then to come up big and actually put it away and win it again. I saw a lot of fans were very much Oh, we look terrible. It's like, look, take the win, enjoy it for a few days, <laughs> and then worry about what has to change. And there's lots that has to change. And you talked about oh, yeah. the end. Yeah, you yeah. can't, to me, this is what I'm concerned with. You know, we one of the reasons and one of the things I liked about Antonio Pierce becoming the Raiders coach was that perceived or or the claimed aggressiveness that we would see. And to play not to lose versus playing to win got them in a little bit of trouble. Hopefully they learn from that moving forward. And, and go for the jugular. I get it. If your quarterback's not accurate or he's getting happy feet or he's throwing the ball and he's it's sailing on him, I get it. You don't want him to turn it over. 
But if you don't have the confidence in your quarterback, that's a different story, right? So we can get into that separately. But I do think that this team, again, from a chemistry standpoint, I still have concerns there because it happened so early in the season. But I think this piece mode, this opportunity for them to face, oh, no, not another one situation and come out on the other side of it with a positive outcome is big for that chemistry and big for the confidence of this team, especially those young players. That, oh, no, it's happening again moment happened, as I said, when Zamir White had the fumble and the Browns mm -hmm. scoop and score a touchdown. Then you're thinking, uh-oh. And the tide is turning again, momentum swing. But with the defense, kudos to the defense doing this with the, without Max Crosby, without Malcolm Koontz, guys stepping up, shutting it down on, on Deshaun Watson, who probably could have had a touchdown. There was a video out. I think Ted Wynn put it out that Amari Cooper was actually open. But because Ja'Korian Bennett was in the passing lane, Deshaun Watson hesitates, pulls the ball down, and tries to escape, and then Charles Snowden closes out the game. So – Great team win from a defensive perspective. And, and if you count the run game, didn't get much from the passing game. But, you know, Jacoby Myers and Trey Tucker had their moments. I, I want to see more targets for Brock Bowers. I don't see how Brock Bowers only gets three targets when Devontae Adams is not playing. Uh, to was, me, that when you talk about things that have to change, that we've now gone through two, we've gone through consecutive games where Brock Bowers just doesn't get enough targets. And, yeah. and that, that has to change. But, it was good to see, and I, and I think this is the main point of the run game, why it got together. Luke Getze used the speed on the roster. Yes. DJ Turner scoring on a touchdown and handoff. Trey Tucker getting the handoff. You saw Tyreek McAllister. Remember, we had a caller ask us. I think it was South Florida Raider uh, was concerned. Or, or a caller from North Carolina said, hey, why is Tyreek McAllister listed as you know a, a wide receiver? And I told him, I said, I think you can use Tyreek McAllister as a gadget player, use his speed. So you saw the Raiders use your speed and it worked on the ground against the Cleveland Browns on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. And that was um, interesting. I think too, that, that was, that was so encouraging to see that young talent use to your point about Brock Bowers. No question. I don't, I don't know what the deal is, but um, I think that, that everyone else that they used and seeing that defense seeing, by the way, Tyree Wilson, I'm not going to argue with you out there. If you just want to tell me Tyree, Tyree Wilson sucked, he didn't. And I know PFF grades can be dubious. He had the highest PFF grade of any Raider defensive player yesterday. A couple other rating services had him there too. So we saw, is it, is it okay, now Tyree Wilson's everything you thought of? No, no, no. But let's start with something, okay? In a moment of need, Tyree Wilson came in, Mo, and um, looked good. You know, he played his role. Is he where he should be yet? No, but. It was encouraging to see him also take a step up in the absence of other players like Malcolm Kuntz and Max Crosby. You, you remember what Adam Butler said to Vic Taylor for the Athletic about Tyree Wilson's development? He says he's taking baby steps, and I yeah. think that's exactly what we're seeing now. As you said, it, is it top seven pick worthy? Absolutely not, right? But we know those aren't the expectations for Tyree Wilson right, right now. I said it. A month ago, I said, no. we're going to have to lower our expectations of Tyree Wilson after what we've heard and read out of training camp and the preseason, of what we've seen out of him. But can he be able to be a productive, serviceable serviceable player? The answer right now is yes. And we, he's taking steps in the right direction to do that, and we can only hope that it he increases his production going forward because guess what? Malcolm Koontz is not coming back. Yeah. He's on season-ending injured reserve. Uh, Max Crosby has a high ankle sprain, so we don't know when he'll be back. He could miss multiple games. So as long as Tyree Wilson is serviceable now alongside Charles Snowden, Janarius Robinson, and the Rays' defensive line still getting pressure with Christian Wilkins coming up the middle, I'll take that if they're still serviceable because you're without your best edge rusher, Max Crosby, and a lot of people weren't giving this defense a chance against the Browns, even though their offense was discombobulated because everybody thinks it's just Max Crosby and, and, and everyone else. Yeah, it seems like people forget the Raiders signed Christian Wilkins to a hundred ten million dollar deal. I don't know why people just kind of overlook his contract. He's just at that pay rate, he's expected to be a game changer. He made his presence felt on Sunday. Yeah, it's interesting. And listen, you know, we all know how good Max Crosby is. We know what he means to this team. But I think part of that is like, you know, the, the, the we, we heard at the press conference Monday, more questions about Max Crosby. It was like, oh, how did you feel without Max Crosby? You know, so it's like it's played into that. And I think some of that is you're not we're not hearing about or giving the credit to 
some of these other guys on defense who are there, right? It's not just Max Crosby, as good as he is. And so so that's what I think fans learned this weekend was, hey, you know, we got some young guys here who when they need to, which isn't always, they can step up. And that is huge. You need that depth. You're going to have injuries again. Uh, and, of course, the Raiders have had a spat of them recently. But moving forward throughout the season, you're going to have them too, just attrition. So you need to have depth. And so am I talking about Super Bowl quality depth? No. But it's nice to know that the Raiders have guys there who can step in and play, Mo, because let's be frank, they just haven't had that over the last five or six years at most positions. At some they have, but not at most. So Tom Sesco is criticized for not bringing in Yannick Ngakwe, <laughs> right, who signed with the Ravens, by the way. I believe he's on their practice squad. Yes. So I'm not, you know, saying they knew this, that Charles Stoner would close the game for them against the Browns, but maybe they feel good about the depth that they have on the defensive line. They brought in Clavon Chason, who had some moments in the game, mm -hmm. showed that he still has some juice in his legs, and Charles Snowden stepping up. Maybe they feel good about the, the group that they have, and they feel like they didn't need to – spend money on a on a on a bigger name and and max crosby will be back we assume from a high school sprain eventually and then now you're looking at it as okay charles snowden Janaris robinson they are third and fourth edge rushers pretty good depth behind uh uh tyree wilson and max crosby if you ask me. yeah absolutely all right we're going to step aside for our first break here on the tuesday edition of silver and black today we come back we'll continue to roll on talking about some of this we'll talk a little bit about that offense again we'll talk about antonio pierce um mo i want to talk about what we saw out of him he had there were some admissions from him in the post game press conference and on monday's press conference about the business decision comment all the up, the uproar that that caused we'll talk about that a little bit and then in segment three we're getting to your calls on the Raider Nation mailbag. Uh, and you are listening to Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports Original podcast, also brought to you by BetUS on video. And you'll hear a word from them right now. Hey, everybody. It is Scott. And you know Mo and I talk about it on the show all the time. And that's putting a little bit of dough on the games. Not only the Raider games, but NFL games. We also like to bet some baseball, a little bit of everything. And to do that, we go to our partners at BetUS. If you haven't bet yet with BetUS, you're missing out. Not only do they have a great world-class website to make those bets, mobile app as well, no matter where you're at, even for our fans in Nevada, you can do it there. But the most important thing is they really take good care of you. Talking about customer service, you know, so many times today it's lost on companies, especially in this growing field of online gambling. But if you look at BetUS, not only do they have great payouts, great odds and pretty much everything you want to bet on but they take care of you you can in fact get a personal betting analyst to, to work with an assistant to work with your own personal assistant they will assign you a person that you can reach out to and they'll help you with it so that's what you want to do but i'm up here on the website just to show you how easy it is and of course i'm wearing my padres stuff because the padres are in the playoffs but we look at football and i'll tell you what you go through this website you're able to see every game in the nfl and this is what we do you know on our thursday shows you guys hear us do it but you can get here you can get the odds not only that but you can also go into the tab here and says markets and you can bet uh, everything from the game the halves to quarters to game props uh and and be able to really make the sunday fun outside of the raiders we know uh your your ride or die with them and it's emotional so i don't necessarily think you should bet on them but nonetheless you got to bet on something you gotta have some fun and at bet usa to do it not only that the amazing thing about this too is guess what they do guess what because mo and i went to bat for you guys yes we went to bat for you the bet us will give you 150 percent signing bonus sign up bonus uh, on your first deposit up to two thousand dollars that's right you heard it 150 so you put 100 bucks down you're getting 150 bucks and you also can deposit your second or third time 125 dollars uh, 125 percent bonus is basically what it is so you put 100 you get 125 that's your next two deposits deposits two and three up to $2,000 as well. And all you got to do is use our special code here. It is YouTube150. Again, that is YouTube150 to get your 150% sign up bonus. This is an exclusive offer here on Silver and Black today from our boys, our girls over at BetUS where the game begins. And again, they will take care of you. They take care of us. You know, we don't just do ads and have partners on the show to do it. We do it with only people that we believe in that we would use. I'm not going to ever try to 
turn you on to a product I wouldn't use, and BetUS does that. But go do it. Check it out. You can bet anything you want from basketball, football, ice hockey, even politics. Look at this. I know we're talking about football, but if I want to bet on the U.S. politics, I go here and check this out. I think I can bet. Look, I can bet on the presidential election right there. The updated odds, Kamala Harris at minus 120, Donald Trump at minus 10. They don't have a point spread. <laughs> Get it? But anyway, you can bet on politics. I know that's a dicey situation to talk about, but all these type things, great parlays, you name it. Again, got to remind you, using this special code, from us here at Silver and Black today from our friends at BetUS. YouTube 150, 150% sign-up bonus on your first deposit up to $2,000 and 125 on the next two deposits up to $2,000 as well. Again, YouTube 150 from BetUS, the official sportsbook of Silver and Black today. Go get them. Welcome back. Segment number two of the Tuesday edition of Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, what is wrong with you? Come on, help us out. Go subscribe wherever you get your audio. If you're watching us on video, whatever channel you're watching us on, whatever social network, subscribe. If you're on YouTube, make sure you hit that notification bell and also give us a like if you would. We appreciate it. Don't forget to review and rate us from the audio side as well. That's great. Scott Cobranson along with Momot and Moses, senior writer, at uh, covering the NFL at Bleacher Report, that is. Also, you can catch him on TNT Sports on True TV as well during the week. Well, he'll always tell you when he's on with that one, usually wearing a tie. And um, right, tie, yeah, tie. And um, don't go bow tie, Mo. I'll, I just we'll have to end the show if you go bow tie. What, what do you have against the bow tie? I just don't like bow tie, I think they're for six year olds, six year olds, six year olds, so, and people so from 1900. So if I get on the show wearing a bow tie, eating a hot dog with ketchup, you're just going to dismiss me as a as a child, right? Like that's that that I might actually put on a 24 hour feed and just and then sh and ship it to those big billboards there near you in in Times Square. Nathan's hot dogs has to give me an endorsement, of <laughs> but yeah. they wouldn't let you put ketchup on Nathan's hot dogs. It would have to be mustard. That's a New York hot dog. Uh, eh. Eh. <laughs> I don't know about that. Oh, well, you can talk to Mo about hot dogs uh, on x.com <laughs> at Mo Moton. M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N is his handle. Uh, I am at LV Gully. Uh, Mo's also the Raiders columnist at sportsnot.com where you can find me as well. So there we go. Uh, brought to you by, of course, the video Bet US, our good friends there. Uh, I won one of my Raiders bets, by the way, buddy. I won the, 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 the straight up bet. I lost my parlay where I took the over. I missed it by a point and a half. Point and a half. So what was the oh what was the number? What was it 37? Total? And it ended up 30. being 36. So those damn uh, odds makers. They, but US they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They're so good. Uh yeah. so but it was so close. I mean, look, if 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 Cleveland had that extra point earlier in the game, mm -hmm. I would have hit that number. Now I still wouldn't uh, have won, but I would have needed one more. But oh well. That's the way it goes. But I want to wait. But, but Scott, as I said, if they hit the extra point, they kick, they definitely kick the field goal to tie the game. And it yes. goes in overtime and you and you win your bet. And then I would so, win my bet. Yes. So blame blame Dustin Dustin Hopkins, the kicker of the Wheaton Browns for yes. But it worked out good for the Raiders and, and our and our listeners love that. So I'm okay losing the hundred bucks, whatever. But it's it's it's, it's all good. So uh, we're moving on. We're talking about Raiders football. Mo, we th th this interesting situation was we had Antonio Pierce come into the press conference this week and say, "Hey, you know, I started the week off bad. You know, we lost the game, uh, and then I came out and I said the business decision quote that you're all familiar with, and he kind of he apologized and he said he apologized to the team as well." Uh, which is great. You know, look, when somebody's wrong, I don't care who you are, how tough you are, what your image is. When you're wrong, you're wrong. If you apologize, especially when you're on a team like that and you're leading a group of men. Um, Want to hear your thoughts on that, though, because you, know, you, you sometimes when you are a leader, as Antonio Pierce is, you can sometimes create more chaos by the things you say or don't say or don't address or, or address. And so, again, I think this is a little bit of the learning curve. And, and you know, it's fine. You, you, everybody has to learn. So I think it's part of that learning curve, though, that we've been seeing in-game decisions included with Antonio Pierce when it came to how he handled that performance by his team last week. 
So there were some Raider fans who had an issue with the way Antonio Pierce handled that that press conference where he basically called out unnamed players and talked about guys making business decisions. There were some people who said he should just kept that in house. Uh, so I want to say he backtracked, but as you said, he's learning. He's an inexperienced head coach, but I also said that he he has a temperature of his locker room, so he should have a feel for how his players are going to respond to public criticism in that manner. Now, I will say he didn't back down off the business decisions that were made on behalf of the team. So remember, he said, we're also going to make business decisions as well. And you saw some of those business decisions. Cody Whitehair benched at the beginning. Uh, Jack Sparrow Johnson getting more snaps. Ja, Jack Jones benched for the first quarter and then coming out for the second quarter. So you're kind of seeing, uh, while, while it wasn't said outwardly, you're, you were seeing the effects, the results of those business decisions made. So I guess maybe he's just uh, not backtracking again, but re regretting almost having gone public with his comments. Mm. And again, maybe he should have just kept more of that in-house rather than give that to the media. Yeah, I, and, and I get that. Like, it, and I think that was that was what I saw from professional commentators who were former NFL players, which there's now a multitude of. When you watch television or read the internet these days, and a lot of them had that same reaction. It was like, "Whoa, that's something you do behind closed doors." Like, nothing wrong with it. It happens all the time. Coaches do it all the time, but you you don't come out to the press conference. So yeah, I think it's a it's a maturity thing, and and I'm sure that he got an earful from the Marvin Lewis types and all that kind of stuff because that's what I if you remember last week I talked about people spreading that Marvin Lewis thing where he's you know mfing his players in the Cincinnati locker room, but again that was in the locker room. I know there was somebody shooting it, but it wasn't released to the press that year. I mean, you're talking about years ago, uh, and so that was something that was just inside the inside the locker room. So these are the type of things, though, and, and this is what you and I said you know, when, when they decided to hire Antonio Pierce. We said, look, that's fine, uh, but understand that you know, with a veteran coach, you, you have this upside downside. With an inexperienced coach, you have this upside and this downside. And so I think we've seen some of that downside through the e early part of the year. Now we're through four weeks. You would hope now – that he's got his footing. He's learned, you know, some things I'm sure on the field. And then now he's learned some things off the field, the hard way. Um, and, and you look at how this game went, he still made some in, in game mistakes, Mo. I thought managing the game. Uh, do you look at it and think you're seeing it get better as far as what you can tell Antonio Pierce managing, managing the game, or you think it's still just a kind of up and down thing. And we're going to see that most of the year. I think we're going to see that most of the year, and you just hope that there are fewer and fewer gaps. So the one mm. thing that stood out to me was I believe they're, the Rays were trying to get in a play, and they had to burn a timeout because yeah. they were trying to, I guess, you know, it was a late down. Late in the game, too. The, late in the game, too. And, yeah. the, and then the commentator pointed out that if you're trying to go up to the line of scrimmage and you should have a, a plan B if, if your plan A doesn't work so that you don't have to burn that timeout. It should be okay. If this happens, you do this. If that happens, you do that. And Gardner Minshew didn't have that, so basically he had to call a timeout, go back to the sideline, and consult. Mm -hmm. And he, he should have had those options when he got out to the field, and that's on the coaching staff, right? So that's one of the smaller things that a lot of people probably didn't pick on, but the commentator did a good job of pointing that out. I think it was Ross Tucker uh, pointing that out, that, you know, have a plan B when you get to the line of scrimmage so you don't have to call that timeout and burn it. But, again, going back to Antonio Pierce and his inexperience, we're going to see this, I think, for most of and, and and you just hope that it doesn't cost you multiple games. Mm. See, in that situation, it didn't cost the Raiders the game, so a lot of people aren't talking about it. But once it gets to the point where you're using too many timeouts when you would need them late in the game, or you're calling timeouts when you shouldn't, or you're going for it when you probably should, you know, punt <laughs> it or vice versa, those are the conversations we're going to have for 2024 and you just hope that Antonio Pierce learns from his mistakes but I will say experienced head coaches make those mistakes as well so Antonio Pierce while he doesn't have a lot on his resume there are coaches out there who've been in it in the game for five six years and still make those mistakes so oh yeah I give, saw give some it, of them yesterday right give Antonio Pierce some grace on that absolutely 100 percent. all right that's good uh when you look at the defensive side of the ball uh, mo i thought that this uh defensive backfield listen i know deshaun watson isn't what he used to be okay so i'm not going out there and saying they shut down the D deshaun watson of old but i thought that the defensive backfield and you talked about palomao doing really really well 
Uh, and and that you know, that is so encouraging. But because with Isaiah Epps out and then a free agent, so he's pretty much done as a Raider, I believe. The fact that you were able to, I know it's just one game, but we also saw him uh, come in if, if for a few of the other contests and perform well. That's big. I think we, and you called that, if I remember, in the in the, in the offseason saying that you really thought that um, he could take a step up. And if he does, that would be huge for the Raiders. We saw that against Cleveland on Sunday. You saw a lot of glimpses out of him during the preseason. And, and I know it's the preseason. It's not a regular game with, with first stringers and starters. But it felt it felt like every time he took the field, he would make plays. He was around the football. And you saw that on Sunday. Yep. I, I think as a 6'4, 220, 215, 220 pounder, I think he could be a matchup defender against tight ends. I think he can step up into the box and help out the run defense. And as I said, he's around the football. So I think he'll have before it's set and done, I think he'll have an interception or two before the season's over. So I'm not calling Isaiah Polo Mao this this gem who turns into an all-pro. I would love it if he does. But I feel like it's an upgrade over Marcus Epps. I had yeah. a graphic up on my Bleach Report Live. Marcus Epps was leading the Raiders in missed tackle rate. Mm -hmm. So he was whiffing on a lot of tackles. Now, we hope he gets well and recovers from that 20 ACL, but it is what it is. He wasn't the best tackler back there. And I think in terms of tackling, coverage is concerned, Isaiah Paul Mal could fill a void in that secondary and potentially uplift that Raider defense. Yeah, ab season. absolutely. And, and still, we don't have any updates on Max Crosby. I know with a high ankle injury, playing that position, Mo, um, you know, I, I never want to rule out Max Crosby because he's such a such a beast. But I'm not real. I'm not real positive that he'll be back against Denver either. Uh, and and we'll see with Devontae Adams. Devontae Adams, what do you make of that? You know, a lot of people now are like, uh, of course, the conspiracy theory stuff starts rolling, not only with him, but Michael Mayer, who we'll talk about in a second. But this injury comes late in the week. Some may think that Devontae Adams was at a little bit at the center of this business decision thing a bit, in which way we're not sure, but nonetheless, some of the reporting has said that. Uh, what do you make of the Devontae Adams situation, the hamstring and that coming late in the week? So I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit. I text Scott early Monday morning. And I said, <laughs> I'm not saying Devontae Adams is feigning an injury, but the timing of the injury makes it a bit, you know, is it a coincidence that they have this call out of players, business decisions, they have this team meeting, and then Devontae Adams pops up on the injury report thir late Thursday. And I'm sure to say he come he came up lame lame in a practice. Basically, he was limping around in practice at the end of it. And now he's week to week and he could miss multiple games. Now, Devontae Adams, he's missed games in his career, but over the past mm -hmm. few years, he's been healthy. He's been on the field. Yep. And there just hasn't been much said about what happened. What you know, what the what the Raiders think, how long they think he's gonna be out. So the timing is fishy. But what I will say on the other side of this is. Vinny Bonsignor of the Las Vegas Review Journal wrote this, and I saw it on Monday, and he said Devontae Adams made a pregame speech. So it's clear that his vocal leadership is still there. Mm -hmm. So that gives me thought that, okay, maybe this was just a coincidence in time. And maybe he really did tweak something. It has nothing to do with the business decisions or the team meeting. He's still addressing the team as a mm -hmm. leader. Also, Adam Schefter came out on Monday and said, the Raiders turned away inquiries for Devontae Adams. Teams were inquiring about Devontae Adams trading for him, and the Raiders basically shut it down without, before the team could even get out their whole proposal. They were just like, no, we're not trading Devontae Adams. And according to Adam Schefter, the Raiders still have no interest in trading Devontae Adams. So for now, the injury just seems coincidental with the timing of the business decisions comment in the meeting, and Devontae Adams is going to be a Raider. But I will say this too, and I've said this plenty of times, Scott. <laughs> if the Raiders are three and six by the trade deadline. That could easily change. Yeah. Tom Tusco can easily say, well, we're three and six. We're not going anywhere. Devon Tams is going to be 32 <laughs> years old in December. Let's make a move now. So the trade room is going to go away. If the Raiders want the trade rooms to go away. And I know Devontae Adams says he wanted the trade rooms to go away when he was on with K Adams. Uh, the Raiders have to win games because if they're a winning team, chances are, Tom Tusco is still turning down those trade offs, right? Which is why he doesn't want to have trade talk because that would mean that the Raiders are doing poorly. And he's he's exactly. he's he's a pro. He wants his team to do well. He loves his brothers. That's what you do. 
So we'll see what happens to your point in a few weeks. The Michael Mayer situation, Michael Mayer has been gone for personal reasons. And then you have some of these salacious Twitter accounts that have been banned and then popped up again who try to prey on Raider fans and say, well, he's getting traded and all this kind of stuff. First of all, there's no reason to trade Michael Mayer, number one. Number two is life happens. I don't know what's going on. It's not really our business. I know we all want to know what's happening. Is he coming back? What's... But you don't know what's happening in people's lives. People get sick. People, you know, there's all kinds of personal issues you got to deal with, and that's what we've been told about Michael Mayer. He's still gone as of today, so he's not with the Raiders, which tells you that it must be something serious. Uh, and so, so I don't look at it as I don't know why people think Michael Mayer needs to be traded because. He hasn't been targeted much either, by the way, including last year when Josh McDaniels was there. And then you have Brock Bowers here. Because you have two tight ends doesn't mean you should just have one. Scott, this comes down to interpretation. So mm. well, let's go back to the Panthers game. Yeah. Tony Pierce said business decisions were made. There are different film guys or different people, different guys, different people have watched the same game. And you have some people coming away from the game saying Michael Mayer made business decisions. And you have some mm. people saying that Michael Mayer did not make business decisions. I watched the game and I didn't get the feeling that Michael Mayer was, you know, giving half effort. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you may you may interpret it differently and say, oh, you know, on this particular play, I don't think he, you know, was giving maximum effort. And maybe he wasn't right. But I don't think he stood out as among the players who who just you know, flat out came out flat and was flat throughout the whole game. So let's remember that Cody Whitehair was benched. Jack Jones was uh, benched for the first quarter. And I think the discipline for Michael Mayer, if he was one of those guys, would, mm. would be, okay, we'll bench him for a quarter or a half, depending yeah. on how much they felt like he wasn't, you know, giving half effort. But I, I don't think they would just, you know, send him away from the team. <laughs> No, completely and say, OK, we don't need you here at all unless it was really egregious. So even the people that felt like Michael Mayer uh, made some business decisions, they didn't think it was egregious to the point where, OK, this guy has to be benched or this guy is definitely not all in. So I think that I think sending a guy away from the team is the extreme. So we saw that with Chandler Jones, right? He was going yep. through some mental issues. The Raiders sent him away completely. I right. don't put Michael Mayer in that category where he's that much of a detriment to the team where you don't even want him at the facility. There mm -hmm. could be something personal going on there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you, in today's world, we all want answers like yesterday. And sometimes they're just not there yet, you know, and, and the team's obligation is to protect their player, especially when it is a personal issue. And if we learn later on that there was something and we'll find out, right? And then we can we can address that with the team as well to say, well, why didn't you why weren't you truthful about it? But I doubt it. I think that's probably something personal. And and we'll see what happens. And if they can if they can use him, uh, they should uh, because Brock Bowers is a different kind of cat. He's not just a tight end, as you saw, he run the ball, which uh, I was watching the game uh, and some of the guys I was with were like why is they running? I said, dude, he did it at Georgia. Like, don't you know anything about him? So uh, I think you're going to see more of that. And you should see more of that, including uh, putting him in different spots, uh, not only in the slot, but outside. There's all sorts of things we've talked about a lot of times on the show. So we'll see how it goes on. But the Raiders, you know, uh, they got over this hump, still got some things to get through. And we'll see if they're able to do it because they got Denver coming up. And of course, they have the nice win streak against Denver. But you could bet Denver's ready and wants to get rid of that stigma of having not beaten the Las Vegas Raiders, even though it'll be in mile high, they, they want to beat the Raiders. So the Raiders are going to have to be on top of their game. All right, Mo, we're going to take our final break, buddy. And when we come back, we're going to get the phone calls. We're going to hear from the people because we're about the people, right? Men of the people. That's right. That's right. We're, all, we're all about you guys. So we're going to come back and get to the Raider Nation mailbag here on Silver and Black today. And Odyssey Sports original podcast Again, thanks to our friends at BetUS for bringing you the video so you can see Mo and I. God bless you. And we will be back right after this. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from, from you. Many Oakland Raider fans, Las Vegas Raider fans. 
on this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. That black hole rock and rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right, we're back with the mailbag. And by the way, Mo, you know, it's, it's weird. We got plenty of calls, but when they got beat last week, the phone went nuts. So I don't know. When, when things go better, people just don't want to sound off. I would think I'd be like, hey, I want to tell you what I liked about it or whatever. But I, I got a theory on that, Scott. Okay, what's your theory? Because a lot of people said this in my Bleach Report live chat on Sunday night. While Raider fans are happy for the win, they weren't thoroughly impressed by the win. And that's okay. And I don't blame them. I wasn't either, right? I, I still think it was a big win just because you needed it. You needed that. Well, we talked about it last week, right? You needed that win. You had to get over that home because things spiral out of control in an organization. I don't care if it's a workplace, it's a team. When stuff starts going bad and you like losing traction, it's like you ever climb up a wet rock and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not, I'm not, I, can't, I can't get any grip. That's what it kind of feels like. And so it, I felt like they staved that off which was big. And again, just seeing these young players do well uh, was was big. So uh, good stuff. All right. Remember, you can call in. Don't be shy. Call in. 702-900-7869 is the number. 702-900-7869. Scott Colbranson, Momotin, back with you. Thanks for watching us, too. Of course, the video brought to you by our friends at BetUS. So make sure you check them out. 150% deposit bonus up to $2,000 on your first deposit. Just use the code YouTube 50. You can find YouTube 150, excuse me. You can find that throughout the description below as well. All right, Mo, let's get to these calls now. First up, we got our friend PNW Orlando. And the PNW, of course, is because he's in Portland. So here's PNW Orlando. Scott Mo, it's a PNW uh orlando here in uh, portland oregon uh still not burning i see a lovely day <laughs> 70 degrees there is a homeless guy next to me though like really <laughs> doing something to a tree stump with a stick so anyway i digress oh, uh just calling i gotta be honest uh i'm happy for the win but uh we'll see what the future holds um but good win uh this defense really stepped it up uh the only comment I've got are two comments real quick. One is on uh, Zeus, or the artist formerly known as Zeus, the way he's running. I love him. Uh, I was really pulling for him, as a lot of Raider Nation is. At this point, I, I don't see how he can start moving forward, really. I mean, Antonio, for all his talk, of, uh, he's not doing it. Great guy, great kid. Maybe he just needs to step back. And just watch for a bit, be the spell running back. He seems to excel in that. Uh, but yeah, love these, but gotta go. Uh, <laughs> and then finally, you know, I'm, I gotta be honest with you. I I just think in a collective, we are we are a better unit uh, without Devonte. I know Devonte is a beast. I know all that, but he's also 31, uh, and he. I don't know. I didn't like the receiver documentary i know other people have commented on that but i just he's not happy there he doesn't want to be there we don't uh the team doesn't need that distraction they just need to move on get as much equity they can out of them i would hold out for a number one pick uh you know i'll throw this out i was doing this with a buddy of mine uh dude you know i would go to jets and say hey either give us the one or pick for pick uh give us uh we'll give you Devonte. you give us Q Williams, and we'll call it good. Um, I don't think they would ever do Q Williams, but uh, Aaron Rodgers is there. He can receivers can't get separation, and uh, I could see him just being the GM that he is doing that pick, doing that trade. So I would love it. Can you imagine that? Q, uh, Max, and Wilkins. Uh, so anyway, good Pretty team nice. win. Uh, hoping, hoping for more. I think Denver though might uh, might uh, exercise its kinks that we've got going there, but we'll see. That's why you play the game. All right, boys, and uh, <clears throat> let's go Raiders, and uh, let's go Cam Ward. It's still Blue Black. <laughs> Thanks for all you do. Bye. There you go. Man after Mo's heart with the Cam Ward talk. PNW yes. Orlando. 
Um, oh, boy, the Cam Ward train. I like Cam Ward. I like a lot. some of those quarterbacks. I like three or four of them, actually, I think would be good. But uh, his point, I look, I don't understand. And I want to say this nicely because, Orlando, you're a good dude. Why do people think that Devonta Adams is going to bring a number one pick? I just don't see it. Like, who's going to do that for a 31-year-old wide receiver? You're not going to do it. Yeah, I, I said this on a previous show that at Devon, because of Devontae's age, mm -hmm. I think the best the Raiders can do is a second-round pick. But the premise of the call, Lando, is good. No, the premise is great. No problem with it. It's absolutely fantastic because, and I wanted to point this out. Last year, I remember doing a show on Bleach Report where the, the topic was trading Devontae Adams. Yep. And people in the chat hammered me for, for even raising the topic. Now I think the tide is turning where more and more Raider fans are okay with allowing Devontae to go elsewhere as the Raiders build their roster. Or in the Landos case, he feels like the offense is better without him. And he's he's not alone because there are a lot of other Raider fans that I interacted with on Twitter that said, I you know, I think this offense can be better without Devontae. Now the passing game wasn't great because of partially because of Gardner Minshew's accuracy issues, mm -hmm. but there were people who pointed out saying that. You know, maybe not having a guy like Devontae demanding so many targets is good for the offense because now you can get other guys involved, the DJ Turners, the Tyreek McAllisters, the Trey Tuckers, Michael Mayer, if he comes back. You can get other guys involved, and they have enough pass catchers to keep the passing game going without Devontae Adams. So, Orlando, you are not alone in that, in that, in that thought. But I will say again that they're probably the best they can do is probably a second-round pick. Yep. Yeah, so we'll see um, what they do. And I, like you said, I think it all depends on where their record is at the time oh, of the trade deadline. One, oh, one yep. thing about yep. Orlando's call. He he said the trade uh, Devontae Adams for a cute Quentin Williams. And you're right, Orlando, the Jets are probably not going to do that. But if you say Devontae Adams for Hassan Reddick, and uh, yes. yeah. I think that's more realistic because Hassan Reddick is still holding out. Now he's going to want a new out. deal, but yeah. if he just wants to go elsewhere and the Raiders don't have to necessarily pay him right away and he's just like a half year rental and the Raiders are still in the mix for a playoff spot, it could be a spot for him uh, on the Raiders roster. Yeah. Yeah. Or if they like him and they want to sign him to a deal, it'd be expensive. Next year. Yeah, yeah. Next year. He could be, could be something there. All right. Next, we're going out to Daniel out in Montana. Here's Daniel. Hey, Scott Moses. It's Raider Daniel from Billings, Montana. I'm just calling to be excited about the Raiders getting the win. We're two and two. I think that most Raider fans would be happy to be two and two after the four game stretch that we had. I think going forward, Alexander Madison might need to be the number one running back if he has a better game. It looks like he runs better. That's the scheme and everything. And, uh, the great effort, great stop by the defense up there at the end. Uh, Snowden got the pressure and then. Also, I thought Harry Wilson had a, had a good game, too. He had some pressures. And uh, so now we got the Broncos next. And uh, we just got to come out with a great effort again and and get the win. But we got to find a way to get Brock Bowers the ball in the fourth quarter. Um, he's not being utilized enough in, Thank in you. key moments. So hopefully we can get that, make those changes. And Denver's got a pretty good defense, so it's going to be mm -hmm. a low-scoring game. And, Oh, we'll have enough offense to get the win. I think we can. We can do it. We have beat Denver for a long time. So Denver's offense doesn't scare me. But I think they have a good defense. But anyways, uh, we'll see what happens. Go Raiders. Let's get to three and two so I can go to the Raiders seal game at three and two. <laughs> All, right. All right, Daniel Montana, thanks for the call, man. You mean you're not afraid of the 60-yard passings of Bo Nix? I mean, they're lighting it up. No, uh, listen, Denver's defense is pretty good, but that, and, and he's right. I, I agree with his call overall, what, what the Raiders need to do. And of course we're all in agreement on the Brock Bauer situation, but the Alexander Madison, we talked about it earlier with the run. I think you got to run the ball against Denver really effectively. And what we see with Madison, is he's got much better lateral movement. He can cut angles where Zeus is much more of a North South guy. And, and we saw Madison really create opportunities. The line was giving him space and he was finding it. And to me, going into this Denver game mode, they've got to get that running game going early and often and control this so that you don't have to overtax your quarterback so you don't create and give up turnover. Because I think this is a game where a turnover is going to decide who wins. 
So the first thing you hear is Antonio Pierce said on Monday that Alexander Madison has earned more snaps. Mm -hmm. He said the same thing about Jackson Powers Johnson before Jackson Powers Johnson broke into the starting lineup on Sunday. So I would assume, and I said this after the game, or I said this after the fumble from uh, by Zamir White. I said, Zamir White, not only is he an inefficient runner in this system, but he has now lost two fumbles in four weeks. Yep. And with this offensive consist inconsistency that the Raiders have, you cannot afford those momentum swings. With those two things combined, I felt like the Raiders had to start Alexander Madison going forward, though I've been calling for this for two weeks now. And I, I want to clarify something with Zamir White because I know it's easy to pile on to him and a lot of people say, oh, Zamir sucks and all of this stuff. I think Zamir is just a better fit for a gap blocking scheme. I don't right. think he's a fit for this system. Correct. He, I don't think I don't think he's I, I think if he goes to another team and it's a different system and not a zone blocking system, I think he'll be fine. Like we saw him in the last four weeks of last year. So let's just remember that Zamir White, the player, just has a certain he he just needs to be in a certain system to be successful and flourish. And right. it's not what the Raiders system is right now. The last thing I will say about Raider Daniels Cole is if Brock Bowers finishes another game with <laughs> you within six targets and Devontae Adams is not playing, my head, my face, my body is going to explode. There is no excuse for not targeting Brock Bowers. I get he was doing a lot of blocking for the run game and doing a very good job at it, by the way. That answers a lot of questions for people who thought, oh, Brock Bowers can't block. Well, oh, look at did. that Browns game. Look at that Browns game and, and try to say that with a straight face. Yeah. But I want to see Brock Bowers. I agree with you, Ray Down. I've been saying it for the past four shows. He needs to get more targets. Absolutely. Great call, Daniel. We appreciate it as always. Now we're going out to our buddy, our new friend, the Yan Dog. Of course, he's a friend of our good guy, uh, Tarek. So here is the Yan Dog. Hey, Scott. Mo, this is Mitch Yannick, a.k.a. Yan Dog. <laughs> uh, I'm happy that we got the win. I know it wasn't pretty. It was 20 to 16, but a win is a win. And we had all those injuries, and we still pulled it out. We had a lot of stars out of our lineup today. I didn't think we had a chance, but we did it. And uh, Mo, getting back to uh, when I, you told me when I call you back, my just want you to know that I'm from Middletown, New York, up by Poughkeepsie ah. and Newburgh. I don't know if you heard of those two uh, towns. Oh, okay? yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I'm from, Middletown, New York, not the Bronx or Brooklyn. And uh, <laughs> just wanted to say uh, that, uh, once again, you guys do an excellent job. And I love to listen to you guys. And uh, I want to be a regular just like my buddy Tarek. Okay, and uh, like I said, I love my Raiders, and you know about that, how long I've been following them. And uh, that's about it, really. Uh, I just hope that we get all our players back, because I think if we were really healthy, I think we could be reckoned with, because we got a lot of talent that's injured right now, and uh, hopefully we could give it all back. And my comment, too, even though Minshew started, I still say AC should get the chance to play, uh, because... I watched him play at Purdue in college. I'm a big college football fanatic, and he had a rifle arm, and he's pretty accurate. So, and uh, that's about it, uh, guys. And I appreciate your time, and uh, hopefully, I'll get on uh, the air with you guys. And uh, <laughs> that's about it. But uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a blessed day. All okay, right. bye bye now. Yeah, and dog. Thanks for the call, man. We appreciate that. Middletown, New York. Middletown. We, uh, us city guys and gals in the five boroughs, we just say that's upstate New York. Yes. I have family. I actually have family in Fort Montgomery. Yeah, and dog, if you're familiar with that area. There you go. See? Yeah, there's connections all over. Six degrees of Mo Moten. Um, you can you can find it. Uh, but his point about O'Connell, by the way, and a lot of folks yesterday, since since Gardner Minshew was not exactly lighting the world on fire, wasn't terrible. Didn't turn the ball over, right? Absolutely. Didn't turn the ball over. To me, that's huge. Um, <laughs> a lot of people, oh, get him out of there, get him out of there. You won the game. I don't think you're going to sit the quarterback. They went, he, he had trouble against Carolina, and they still started him. I still think that even though Antonio Pierce – no question the relationship with Aiden O'Connell, he's going to go with the experienced guy they believe is going to give him the best chance to win until they don't feel that way anymore. 
I don't see that coming off a win. Um, and I don't see it coming off one loss unless it's so disastrous. Like I said, then all bets are off, but I don't see a change coming anytime soon. Do you Mo? No, but here's my take on the Aiden O'Connell Garner Minshew switch idea mm. is I want to see the offensive line put together multiple good games before I put Aiden O'Connell under center there good point. because he's less mobile than Garner Minshew. So if your offensive line isn't consistent and you put a less mobile quarterback back there, Aiden O'Connell is going to take a handful of sacks and you don't want that. No, and I, and I, and I know a lot of people are going to counter and say, "Well, Aiden O'Connell is a quick release," and I understand that. But if you want the downfield plays, you need time for those plays to develop downfield to get the ball downfield. Yeah. So I want to see before I make a quarterback switch. If Gardner Minshew is not playing well, I want to see the offensive line be able to pass protect well for more than one game because we know the offensive line struggles through the month of September. Now, overall, they played well against the Browns, but I want to see it again. I'm a guy. What's the C word, Scott? Consistency. <laughs> I want to see the consistency with the, the consistency. pass blocking before I put a less mobile quarterback back there on the center. Yes. Yes. Yeah, dog. Thanks for the call, man. All right. We're going out to Orange County, California, going out by the beach, sunshine, bikinis, whatever you want to think in your mind. Uh, we're going back out there with our good friend, Misha. What's up, Scott? What's up, Mo? What's up, Murph? Hope you guys are doing well. Calling you uh, from Orange County. It's Misha. Um, post game from a really gritty win today. Um, I think, uh, you know, first first drive for the Browns, and then we go three and out after. Obviously, all the all the trauma from past Raiders uh, experiences <laughs> left me kind of, you know, worried there. But, you know, good job bouncing back. Um I know it was a win and everything, uh, and I don't want to be too negative here, fellas, but but two things. Number one, Luke Getsy's got to go. I, I'm sorry, but did this guy, I don't know what the hell he's doing out there. Um, that that third down run with uh, Zamir White where he fumbles the ball, he gets the ball, you know, three, four, five, I don't know, yards uh, in the backfield. So it's not even a third and two. It's like a third and, and, and seven, and – it's just a poor play. Like, why can't we, you know, we, we don't have any creativity on offense. It's all very bland. It's very boring and it's very basic. There's just no creativity. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And I, again, I don't want to be negative. I get it. We won. And I'm really happy about that. But golly, this guy is just atrocious. Um, and number two, uh, big shout out to Alexander Madison. I don't know about you guys, but in my point of view, I think he's done enough at this point to uh, get the lead back position. No disrespect to Zamir White, but I think Alexander Madison clearly is the RB1 moving forward. Um, much love to you guys and much love, Raider Nation. On to the next one. All right, there you go. Misha from Orange County, appreciate the call. And Mo, I mean, obviously we agree with him on Madison, but I do think his point about the the play calling being pretty unimaginative. We saw the Trey Tuckler re reverse for the touchdown uh, earlier in the game. You saw did, bits right? and pieces of it, right? But it's, it goes back. Oh, no, here comes your word again. Consistency, right? So we don't see – and I'm not saying you go gadget play consistently – but you're not seeing very different looks very often. How many times did we see Zamir Wright giving the ball, like you said, three, four yards behind the line of scrimmage, just like last week, and he goes up the middle, and guess what? He gets no yards, one yard, maybe two if he's lucky. Um, what is this going to be? It seems like there's been conversations between Antonio Pierce and Luke Getze because there's some changes, but it seems like maybe there's got to be more or maybe it's a progress, a progressive situation where – Antonio Pierce is going to have to get Luke Getzey to be like, okay, dude, we've seen some good stuff, but why are you still doing this stuff? Let's get on the same page here. So I asked Raider fans to rate Luke Getzey's play calling performance Sunday night. There are a lot of C's and D's in those responses. And I guess, mm -hmm. I, I guess, I guess Misha would be on the F <laughs> part of that spectrum. He wants him fired. Uh, I give Luke Getzey credit for, invigorating the run game and and six ball carriers other than quarterback Garner Minshew got a carry at least one carry on Sunday so the creativity is there a bit so you gotta give him credit for that right 
on the other side, as Misha pointed out, wasn't great as far as formation and situation is concerned. That that's still a that's still an issue going forward. That's something he has to change. But because the Raiders win the game, because they ran for more yards in one game than they did in the first three weeks, he's not going anywhere because he's showing <laughs> some progress. Right, right. And you're and you're just hoping that he continues to show progress and continues to tweak some things that he does with his play calling. And that the Raiders finally get their offense running on all cylinders. I'm not going to hold my breath on that, but I will say he's not getting fired anytime soon. No, I I do understand the criticisms. Me sure, too, they're fair, but, but they're, they're absolutely fair and valid. But let's just remember that he did have some good things that he did, and I, and I think the Raiders look at that and say, okay, there's room for growth there for Luke Getzey as a play call. I'm going on a limb here. I think it's only week five. I think Luke Getze is here all year, but I don't think he's back next year. I think the Raiders are going to have a new quarterback. They're going to have to get a new running back. Uh, and so to me, if you're going to make a switch, that would be the right time to do it. Um, you gave the opportunity. Let's see. Unless Luke Getze changes minds, which is possible. Not saying it's impossible, but I just don't see it happening. So anyway, Misha, thanks for the call, man. We certainly appreciate it. All right, we are now uh, going out. Our last call comes from our good buddy, Tarek, in Boston. Here's Tarek. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mo. This is Tarek calling you guys again from Boston. Uh, just saw the Raiders wrap up the win against uh, the Browns. Uh, man, I swear they always give their fans a cardiac arrest. <laughs> it's nice to approach a game with no expectations, which I do not have any. Uh, you never know which team is going to show up each week, which version of the Raiders is going to show up. Definitely ran the ball better. There was uh, definitely some better play calling. Uh, it, it, there were... Definitely moments where the, the play calling was really vanilla, and other times it was pretty creative. Uh, I don't know where that's been the whole season, the whole season, but it's nice to see. Uh, you know, obviously both teams were depleted with injuries, uh, but you did see on both sides of the ball, we were playing with some juice, some energy, some life, some passion. So it was nice to see that. It's nice to <clears throat> nice to get to two and two, especially considering uh, we were without some key players. Um, Brock Bowers was almost non-existent in this game and uh and Devonte obviously was out as well but uh but we definitely uh, brought the juice and it was nice to get to two and two uh we played the, the the donkeys next in denver they're they're also two and two uh they found a way to win at the jets i don't know how they did that but we still have some significant <laughs> issues but we've definitely seen flashes and some potential of what it could look like but um again until we Clean up in so many areas, uh, still can't really. Uh, we did run the ball pretty well, but we got to show that we can do it uh, repeatedly, uh, not just once in a blue moon. Yep. It can't be sporadic. Uh, we did a pretty good job with the run defense for the most part, and we did a good job getting to uh, uh, getting to Deshaun Watson. Well, I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on the game this week, guys. Nice to start the work week uh, with a win. <laughs> uh, go Raiders. Definitely, it always feels better after a victory. You guys have a great show. Have a great week, and I look forward to hearing you guys. Talk All to right. you later. Go Raiders. Bye-bye. There's our guy, Tarek, to close out the calls on the Raider Nation mailbag. Hey, it got, he basically, I mean, he said it better than I did, but it consistency. Like, I think fans sure. overall, it's like you want to believe, and, and Murph says this on the postgame show all the time about expectations. You want to believe. So, okay, so, yo, it's terrible against Carolina. Now you come back, eh, it's better against the Browns. And so now you want to go to Denver. Now it's serious because you're talking about Denver. So you want to see the Raiders not only play better, but just continue to climb that ladder towards respectability and towards consistency. So what do we learn here? If you're a Raider fan watching the Raiders this season, mm -hmm. it's best to go into the game without high expectations. Because yes. if you don't have high expectations, you're not disappointed if they crap the bed. And you're pleasantly surprised if they have a big win. Now, this wasn't a huge win because it was Cleveland Browns bad football team. Just want to note, do you notice the difference between Tarek calling in after the Ravens <laughs> win and Tarek calling in after this win? Notice yeah. that, right? The ex he was happy for the win, but the excitement level wasn't as high. We, we and, and then I, last week with right. Carolina, remember we had we had like Tarek on Christmas morning as an eight year old. <laughs> yeah. Then we had last week we had somebody just died, and then this week we had the middle ground Tarek. So. You're right. Right. Absolutely. It's so, good. We've seen all three sides. We've seen all three <laughs> versions of Tarek, but <laughs> I think Tarek's reaction is a microcosm of a lot of people in Raider Nation where you're happy for the W, Yeah. but you know you beat a bad team and there were a lot of things that the Raiders need to clean up. So you're while you're excited, not excited, but you're happy for the win, you're still cautiously optimistic. Like, okay, Denver has a better defense. 
Denver has two upset victories consecutively. They upset the, the Tempe Buccaneers 26 to 7, and then they beat the Jets 10 to 9. Both games on the road, by the way, holding both teams to a combined 16 points. Their defense is on another level right now. Yeah. You're saying, okay, they got this win and beat the Browns. Can they keep it together and hold that winning streak against the Denver Broncos? Because if they lose that game against Denver, then we're going to get angry Tarek again, who's at a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> just saying that's what's going to happen yes and and it's interesting though too it's like it's sort of like buying a lottery t- you spend five bucks on a lottery ticket and you win 10 and you're like oh that's you know well, i won 10 bucks i didn't win 40 million but i won 10 well, it's okay and then of course you turn around and you spend it on lottery tickets again or whatever you buy so i get that that reaction uh is and i think it's typical right when, when you're in a situation like this where you have a team that's up and down and you're not sure who they are so we'll see if we can see who they are after this game against Denver. So there you go. Mo, uh, it's Tuesday. I know you got something tomorrow, and of course you got your TV stuff. Let everybody know what you got coming up in the next few days so that they can participate and hopefully heckle you. You can heckle me over at Bleacher Report, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific. I'll have a topic to be determined. Send me your suggestions at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. Thursday, I'll be previewing week four. Five, so it may sneak in a Raider topic in there, being that nice. the, the Broncos are trying to break this losing streak to the Raiders. And of course, I'll have a sports not piece up. I'll determine what that topic will be. Maybe I'll focus on Devontae Adams because a lot of people are now, as I said, moving toward trading him. Maybe I'll focus on the defense, Charles Snowden, Isaiah Polamau. Who knows? I'll leave it up to surprise. Check it out over on Sports Night on Thursday. Surprise, surprise with Mo. How about that? So that's good. All right. Well, we will be back here on Thursday. So come and join us. Uh, We'll preview the game with the Broncos, see what else is going on, see if we have any injury updates on both Devontae Adams and Max Crosby and whoever else, whatever else pops up between now and then as well. Maybe Michael Mayer will be back. Also, uh, we'll find out too. We'll get the press conference with Luke Getze coming up. Uh, today later today on tuesday so we'll figure out what he has to say maybe we can get some answers there too on what's going on and why they're why michael mayer or excuse me while brock bowers is not getting any targets get a little insight there so we appreciate it and we certainly appreciate you guys being with us as always and do us a favor make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio if you're watching us on video subscribe there as well hit the notifications bell give us a thumbs up Give us also a rating and a review if you're listening to us on the audio. We certainly appreciate that. We want to thank our producer, Mike Robier at Odyssey. Also, again, remind you that the show brought to you on video by our good friends at BetUS. Make sure you go get that offer. We're going to flash it up here at the end of the show, but get that offer, that 150%. Come join us. We'll talk about some betting on Thursday's show. We'll put down some bets on not only the Raiders, but on some of the weekend action, including the Thursday night game. So we'll see how... Mo and I have done and what we're able to do. Mo, my friend, I will see you on Thursday. Take care, Scott. Take care, Raider Nation. All right. For everybody here at Silver and Black today, have a great rest of your Tuesday and your midweek. We'll talk to you back on Thursday. Thanks for being with us, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right, let me get this.